Thank you so much for joining me today on Just Praise Him Radio. I'm your host, Glenda Lomax, and my job is to inspire you to a closer walk with Christ. Now here's the show. Hello, believers. Welcome to the Just Praise Him radio show. I'm your host, Glenda Lomax, and the title of my message today is Walking Through Adversity, and this is part one. There'll be at least one more part to this, I think. Uh, This is my second time recording this. I recorded it in the wee hours this morning, and it just, I don't know, it didn't sound right to me, so we're going to do it again. You know, we live in a very unusual time. We are staring down the barrel at the end of the age, the end of everything the end of times that the Bible talks about in Revelations, and the end of us on earth. God strengthens us ahead of bigger trials to help us pass tests, to help us learn what we need to know for what comes next. He builds your faith a layer at a time until you are tough enough to withstand just about anything. Considering the time we're walking into, how hard will the faith test be now in this season? I was thinking recently of when I lived in the big house in Arkansas, and I decided to try growing some vegetable plants just to see if I could. They were talking about food shortages and this and that. And I tried it out, and then I gave them away to someone who actually knew how to grow grow plants. But anyway, I had all these pretty little vegetable plants growing near windows and under grow lights, and they all needed very specific care. I would not set them out into the open ground because there was so much wildlife there they would have gotten them, and it would have just looked like a lawnmower came across them. When you live in a forested area, even your flowers outside are not safe. The deer there ate all the blooms off my tulips. I didn't even know that animals ate tulips. So I decided what I wanted to grow, and as I studied what conditions each of the plants needed, I learned that to have healthy plants, um, because I was talking to my son about it, I learned that you need to have healthy plants, you need to put a fan on them, on high and I was like, what? Those On those delicate little stems, I was afraid they'd all be blown down and die before the next day. No. As strange as it sounds, the wind gives the plant something to resist against and forces it to grow a stronger stem. The winds from the fans strengthen them so they can withstand the even worse conditions they will face in the future. And this is the same way the winds of adversity strengthen us. Without the wind, those baby plants only have a tiny hair-like stem that does not have even enough strength to support the weight of its leaves. And so it falls over under the weight of its own life and dies. Which I had experienced many times in my youth trying to start plants from seed because I'd been trying to grow plants from seed since I was like seven years old. I remember being in the second grade and growing cantaloupe plants. I just thought I didn't have a green thumb. It turns out that a green thumb is just a matter of understanding what plants need to grow and flourish. So I'm not planning on trying to farm anytime soon or anything, but I learned an important spiritual principle from growing those plants. Like us, they are strengthened by the winds of adversity. They literally cannot live without those winds. If you've ever been through very much adversity, you know adversity will either make you or it will break you in half. If you try to fight what is happening by turning to sin, to sexual pleasure or addiction, it can destroy you very suddenly. That is Satan's intent for all the adversities you face. But God's intention is that you resist it in Him and grow from it. You have to choose which way you will respond to it, and that is what determines the outcome for you. I want to read you a column I wrote years ago when I was writing for a newspaper in western Oklahoma because I believe it applies directly to what is soon to befall all of us who are still on the earth when the bad stuff hits. This is published in my book, Sidewalk Flowers, and it's called Adversity. Courage doesn't always roar. Sometimes courage is the little voice at the end of the day that says, I'll try again tomorrow. That's a quote by Mary Ann Rodmacher. Sometimes life deals us a situation so adverse a loss so great, we feel unable to meet the challenge of facing day after day in our pain and loss. I remember in 2003 when our family lost first my older sister, Judy, and then a nephew just two months later. It seemed the tears would never end. We felt unable to walk day by day, confronted with such intense grief and sorrow. One day life seems fine, 
and everything is normal. And the next thing you know, it throws you a curveball and you are knocked completely off balance. How do you face each day now? How do you get up tomorrow morning and walk through each hour in agonizing pain and still function? Will you always feel this way? Will the pain ever end or just continue forever? Few of us could bear the thought of living the rest of our lives in such torment. Those facing a divorce, the loss of lifelong dreams, the loss of a loved one, or a debilitating illness have stood and stared at the giant question mark face to face. How do I get through this? Can I get through this? Opportunity may only knock once, but adversity has a lot more patience. It can knock for years. All the more reason to learn how to handle it when it shows up knocking on our own door. It is a battle between fear and faith. Our fear that we will always feel so miserable or faith that time will ease the pain and our tomorrows will be better than our today. John F. Kennedy said in a speech in 1959, when written in Chinese, the word crisis is composed of two characters. One represents danger and the other represents opportunity. Crisis or severe adversity does bring with it opportunity of one kind or another. Adversities such as divorce bring with them new beginnings, a chance to reinvent oneself, to embrace a change of scenery, to do things you never considered doing before. A job loss brings the opportunity to explore possible career changes, a change of location, new skills to learn. Instead of focusing on our misery and our loss, we must rise up and look crisis square in the eye, look for any new opportunities in our situation, and move forward. Just one step forward. After that step, we contemplate the next step, always keeping our eyes on hope while turning our faces away from our distress. Hope is the solid knot at the end of the fraying rope you are clinging to that keeps you from sliding off into nowhere. Though we need to learn from yesterday, we still have to keep living today and should always strive to hope for a better tomorrow. One sure thing about life is things will always change. You will not always feel the way you feel today. It may take days or weeks or even years, but there will come a day when you will awake and notice the sun is shining again. Your heart has moved on and a new phase of your life has arrived. When Japanese mend broken objects, they aggrandize the damage by filling the cracks with gold. They believe that when something has suffered damage and has a history, it becomes more beautiful. That's a quote by Barbara Bloom. And as I said, that's excerpted from my book, Sidewalk Flowers. So I had just gotten up and sat down with my coffee, and I was thinking about adversity. I was thinking about how some people meet adversity very young, growing up in terrible childhoods, neglected, abused, or unloved living in terrible poverty or with the wrong parents or siblings. And others meet adversity later in life. Maybe they grew up in idyllic childhoods and they got married in June right after high school. And then the marriage that looked like the prince or princess charming, champagne and roses, turns out to be a pot-bellied alcoholic with crying babies in a shabby rent house. I had been praying every day for revelation to share with you about adversity. And the Lord whispered into my spirit, Terrible childhoods are a chance to reveal my glory. Bad marriages can become examples of my glorious redemption. They are opportunities. And I thought, opportunities? He showed me that every negative situation and experience is just another place for him to shine through our lives to others. I guess I never really saw it that way before. Because he is willing to heal us of every effect of those bad childhoods, he is willing to heal those bad marriages and addicted spouses. Are we willing to pray that long enough for him to do it? Are we willing to decree the promises, fast and pray, and really believe and stand in faith? I know some people are willing, and they will. I believe in our instant gratification society. Most will not. And of course, the other spouse in a marriage must be willing to work through the problems as well, and many are not. The Lord will not override anyone's free will. We all have free will and free choice, and that's great, but it's also the downfall of many a stubborn person. Many are not willing to let the Lord into their lives at all. 
I knew someone years and years, well, decades ago when I first got saved, who was believing for the restoration of his marriage. And I never saw that the whole time that I was in contact with him. And I think that was because he was willing, but his ex-spouse was not. She moved on and probably remarried. I don't know. But many are not willing to let the Lord into their lives. They're afraid of what he might ask of them, terrified of what their friends will think if they serve the living God. What excuse will you give when you stand before the King of Kings on Judgment Day? Oh, I didn't want my friends to have that opinion of me. I wanted to be cool and be accepted. You can say that if you want. It is your free choice, but you won't feel cool or accepted in hell. I'm just saying. And hell is a real place. The Bible is true. God is real. And hell is just as real as heaven is. Otherwise, the whole Bible is a lie. Think about that. It's all real or it's all not real. So adversity is just opportunity for God to shine through. What then is our part in it? Adversity differs from one person to the next. But we will all face it sooner or later. Some people grow up in adversity. Some people marry into adversity. Some people go to work in adversity. Adversity is never easy, but it is an opportunity to showcase our great God and bring Him glory. And it comes to teach us lessons. I have lived some pretty long seasons of my life in adversity, and I can tell you this. I never did learn much from the good times, but times of adversity will teach you a lot about yourself, about the people around you, and most of all about the Lord. I knew other people who lived in adversity. My mother, my mother's faithfulness and courage, her faith in God showed through in everything she did and said. Her favorite saying was, take it to the Lord in prayer. That was her favorite thing to say if anybody had a problem. My grandma, Emma, her faithfulness and courage and devotion to God and her conviction as a Christian, she lived what she believed. I mean, she lived it, and it showed through. And my grandmother, Emma, had a tough life, y'all. She had 11 children. She lost three children, a set of twins that was stillborn, and uh, a two-year-old that would have been my Aunt Dolly had she lived. And grandmother was abandoned by my grandfather with those children and left in the boonies of what part of Oklahoma? I can't, I think it was the Rush Springs area, that county. But anyway, in Oklahoma or or West Texas, left alone with those children with no job, no income, and no money to fend for herself and take care of those kids. Their childhood was so hard that my Uncle Bob, he's my last surviving uncle, told me, that he didn't have any good memories from his childhood. And he remembers hearing about the twins being carried out in little shoeboxes, I think, shoeboxes or wooden boxes, little wooden boxes, he said they buried them in. He was just very sad. And and Grandmother Emma, she was so amazing. My sister Judy, she was the eldest of the five of us. She got rheumatic fever when she was, I think, around nine years old. I can't remember the exact age, but... They said it damaged her heart. She was operated on in her first open-heart surgery. She had more than one. She had, I think, two. I know she had at least two. I don't think it was three, but I know she had at least two because I remember both of those. Dr. DeBakey in Houston, who is famous, um, he, he operated on heads of state. I mean, people from other, heads of state from other countries and all kind of stuff. If you read his bio, it is amazing. But he operated on her, and she you know, lived a lot longer because of, of his expertise. Her courage and her sweetness never left her. Her life was so hard between being ill and, you know, that makes it hard to hold a job when you got to take off for, you know, two or three months to have a surgery. That's, that's, they don't always take you back. And she, it never changed her. She was always so gentle. And all, she never became bitter in spite of the fact that, you know, she struggled all the time. And she stared death in the face every single day. I remember times when her heart went into arrhythmia because every payday she had to choose whether she was going to pay her bills or buy her medicine. She was on, I think, like 11 medications from a young age in her 20s. Kimberly, my niece, is an amazing person. She is one of the most sweet, forgiving persons in our entire family. And she's had plenty of 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 chances to forgive other people because she's had a lot of people hurt her. 
She is one of the bravest that I've seen. She has been through things that if I told you her life story, it would make you weep. I admire her greatly. She has never become bitter. She's Judy's daughter. Um, she was her only daughter. She never became bitter, and she witnesses for the Lord every single day, and her life has never been easy, ever. She works hard at the business that she herself built from nothing and has a good reputation among everybody that knows her. And she glorifies the Lord to everybody she speaks to. Now, that's taking adversity and using it to glorify God, y'all. That's what I'm talking about. My Aunt Dorothy, who was my mother's older sister, was also a very sweet person. She loved God so much. She, When she was a teenager, uh, an older teenager, she was engaged. And she broke up with that man because a preacher came along that wanted to marry her. And she married the preacher. And they planted, I don't know how many churches across Texas. And she was never with anybody else. That's who she was with from then till they both died. And they never, ever had enough money. She faced all kind of challenges, and I never one time heard her complain. Not one single time in my life did I ever hear her complain or hear a single thing come out of her mouth that did not glorify the Lord. And I don't know how people achieve that. That amazes me when I see that. It's like my grandma Emma. They just amaze me. I wish I could have her on the podcast. I wish I could have Grandma on the podcast too, but they were both at home with Jesus. So let's talk about a couple people in the Bible. Preserve me, O God, for in thee do I put my trust. Psalm 16, 1. King David. I find it so sad that with all his devotion to God and everything that he accomplished, the thing most people remember about David was his sin with Bathsheba. And that was just one human weakness and a man who glorified God through everything else he did in so many ways. His faith showed in all his trials. His reverence for God showed especially through refusing to kill King Saul, who was chasing him through the wilderness for how long, when he easily could have. He had the chance. He was right there. He chose to live on the run rather than to touch God's anointed. Tell you what, you touch God's anointed, it never ends well for you. It never does. He must have known that. And said, Naked came I out of my mother's womb. Naked shall I return thither. The Lord gave, and the Lord taketh away. Blessed be the name of the Lord, said Job. In Job 121, we have all had those times, poor Job. When we have suffered a great loss or multiple losses and are in pain and Job's friends show up and make us feel even worse, have we not? I bet you know whose Job's friends' names are, not the ones in the Bible either. Poor Job. I'm sure he did not understand why he was afflicted, but, but I think he did understand that we're not guaranteed to get an explanation of everything God you know, allows in our lives. God doesn't have to give us an explanation. He doesn't owe us any explanation. And I think Job understood better than most people that God is God, and he can do whatever he pleases with us. And he continued to exalt God, even in his time of complete devastation. And God gave Job double after he prayed for his friends. Peter and Paul. 2 Corinthians, Paul writes, For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, works in us a far more excellent and eternal weight of glory. Amen to that. Peter and Paul and the other disciples suffered unbelievable hardship in spreading the gospel. Whippings, imprisonments, hunger, and constant travel. Yet they stood on what they believed and continued to preach, even as they stared death in the face as they did it. May we be as bold and courageous as they were for the Lord. Y'all know I have lived my whole life in Tornado Alley. I still remember to this day the first time I saw a twister lowering down out of a black cloud in Elk City, Oklahoma. And I remember photographing another one lowering near Cheyenne, Oklahoma. So do I live in fear of tornadoes? No. I cannot stop a tornado from coming if the Lord decides to allow one in an area where I happen to be living. Storms are going to come into our lives, and we don't know when, and we don't always know how. As a matter of fact, we seldom know how. You know, you get up one day and you think everything's going to be a normal day and boom, it's not. Maybe you are in a financial storm right now or a job loss storm or a my spouse has lost their mind and is acting crazy storm. Any day we can get up and be hit by a storm, we don't know how to get through, can't we? 
Tornado Alley is challenging. We don't know when the bad storms will come or if we will live to see the other side of them. But there are things that we can do and that we try to learn those and we try to understand the storms and be prepared in case one shows up today. What we can do is pray for protection against bad storms and pray Psalm 91 against them and any other destructive weather or storms that come into our lives. Over my lifetime, I have learned other things that I can do knowing the storms will come. Speaking of natural storms right now, what I can do is have renter's insurance in case what little I have gets picked up and blown away. What I can do is make sure all my legal documents are safeguarded in a bank vault along with anything else I value that is irreplaceable. So just little things like that. I want to tell you a story. Adversity is like a strong wind. It tears away from us all but the things that cannot be torn so that we see ourselves as we really are. It's a quote by Arthur Golden from Memoirs of a Geisha. In the early hours of a January morning in Texas years ago, a man was jolted awake to a nightmare. His friend was rushing down the stairs of the two-story home he lived in, yelling, The house is on fire. He leapt from his bed, grabbing things off the wall, throwing things from the doorway to the bed of his truck outside, dragging furniture into the yard, trying to save what little he could. The fire department had been called, but by the time they reached the country home 15 minutes later, what had once been a charming old farmhouse had been transformed into a pile of ash. To add to his misery, while the fire department was spraying the propane tank to prevent a possible explosion, the furniture caught fire and was also destroyed. The man loved living in that century-old farmhouse out in the country because he could see the sunrise and set with a clear view. He loved sunrises, the dawn of a new day, and he often photographed them. It had always been his dream to live a peaceful life in the quiet serenity of the country, close to nature. A carpenter by trade, years later he would go to get a particular tool only to remember it had burned up in the fire. Still, he said the most precious thing he lost that night were not so much his possessions, but all his years of mementos and irreplaceable souvenirs. He called them the little things you pick up along the way of life and his family photos. Sometimes life rolls along smoothly and everything goes according to plan. One morning you wake up thinking it'll just be another ordinary day, and tragedy strikes. Sometimes you lose a loved one, get a terminal diagnosis. You or a loved one is involved in a traffic accident, and the staggering winds of adversity suddenly begin to blow out of nowhere at an almost unbearable gale. When adversity strikes from out of the blue, when loss tears from you what is most precious, when the unexpected slips into our lives in the darkness of night, and turns what we treasure to ashes, that is when we discover who we truly are. In the fight to survive against such strong winds of change, all the masks come off. All the little things that once seemed to matter so much are cast aside. And the difficult task of rebuilding or recovering becomes your sole focus. All that is left is the truth of who you are. Your strength or weakness, optimism or bitterness, faith or fear, and who you will allow yourself to become as a result of what has happened to you. Will you be hopeful another day, or will you let life make you bitter and angry? Will you be courageous and struggle to rebuild what was lost, or will you surrender to tragedy's pain? Only you can answer that question, and all of us, at one time or another, must answer the questions adversity asks of us. We can listen to the voice of fear telling us all the reasons we cannot possibly survive or succeed, or the voice of faith telling us nothing is impossible, or the voice of failure saying it's no use. Or we can listen to the voice of hope whispering, get back up and try one more time. The man lost most everything of value he owned in the house that night. He was renting and had no insurance to cover his loss. He had his vehicle left, a few pictures from the walls and a few tools, but nothing else except the fortitude that makes him the courageous man he is. In 15 minutes, his entire life changed. He lost his home, and he was faced with starting over. When asked how he handled such a devastating tragedy on that cold January night, he answered, You just start building again. You go get some clothes and get a place to stay and start over. You just start over. 
That fire may have destroyed his possessions, his photographs, and even his mementos of childhood, but it could not burn up his hope, his strength, his character, or his courage to live and see one more sunrise. You know, there's a saying by Winston Churchill, if you're going through hell, keep going. That's another column that I wrote when I was writing newspaper stuff years ago. That fire happened in the 1980s, and the man in that story was my brother Jerry, who was born about five years before me. Jerry was a part-time carpenter. He was very poor, and he lived very simply. This is the same brother that had the rule, if you start talking about God in his house, he would ask you to go home. When he went to file for Social Security just months before his 65th birthday, he was over the moon that he was going to be getting $800 a month. He had never had that much monthly income in his life. He was so excited. He lived a life of terrible hardship, but it was because he rejected God. He died in early December of 2019, three weeks before he would have started getting that $800 a month. Finally, as he lay dying of cancer in a hospital bed in McKinney, Texas, my cousin Bob was able to lead him to the Lord. He died within a couple of weeks of getting saved. Proverbs 13, 15 states, The way of the transgressor is hard. A transgressor is somebody who acts without faith. And that word hard means rough, strong, and it keeps on coming. So the way of someone who acts without faith is rough, it's strong, and it keeps on coming. It don't stop. His life would have been immeasurably easier if he had accepted Jesus earlier. And I had tried to witness to him too, and so had my mother and everybody else I know. But like me when I was young, he did not think he wanted that life. May he rest in peace and enjoy those streets of gold and all the peace and restfulness that heaven has to offer. Because he sure didn't have a lot of rest down here. You know, we have a responsibility to properly represent who the Lord is. My mother did a phenomenal job of that, and my grandmother too. My mother was the sweetest, most loving, forgiving person you can imagine. Everyone who met her loved her. You couldn't help it. There was just nothing about her not to love. She witnessed to others about Jesus her whole life, having gotten saved as a child. My Aunt Dorothy, my mom's older sister, was like that too. So sweet and so loving and forgiving, so gentle. I did not understand why Jesus died on the cross when I was growing up. I wish I had asked someone why he had to die. I did not understand anything, so I was not drawn to the gospel. I went the way of the world, but the Lord chased me into the world. And thanks to my mama's and my sister's unrelenting pleadings before his throne to save me, <laughs> there I was, running as fast as I could like a track star, running with the world the other way from Jesus and the church. And it was like the Lord caught me by the collar and made me listen. You know, no matter who you are, you want to know what the truth is. And I was the same way, the real truth. When he sent me that word of knowledge and prophetic word through someone whose walk I had witnessed and admired, I knew I had found the truth and I grabbed hold and haven't let go since. The fact that he was God and he noticed me and sent me a word just astounded me and still does to this day. He saw me and he was alive. All the world had to offer me faded into nothing when I saw that. Best decision I ever made, maybe the only good decision I ever made my whole life. My mom and sister had begged me to accept Jesus, but I would not hear them. It was not their fault, but mine. They lived the life and I saw it, but I needed more proof to give up all my worldly fun. I just didn't want to give it up, y'all. It is harder to come to the Lord once you have tasted the pleasures of sin. Can I just tell you that? And when you don't know Jesus, those pleasures speak very loudly to you because your flesh has a very loud voice when you're not spiritual. Once you know him, you see those pleasures for the nothing that they are. I had witnessed to my brother Jerry about the Lord, but he was, he was just like I was. He just didn't see anything worth giving up whatever fun he was having for. At that point, I don't know how much fun he really was having because his life was so hard. But he wanted to keep it, and I don't wit witness in a pushy way. I will share with someone what the Lord has done for me and how he has changed my life. But I'll stop after that. I, I never want to alienate anyone from the gospel by trying to force feed it to them. That only makes them run harder. And you, you know, they say a brother offended is hard to be one. It's similar to that. If you make them afraid of Christians, they'll run from every Christian they see. That won't help them get saved. If you are living right and God is blessing you, then your life should do the preaching for you. 
if you are not living right, you cannot witness to anyone because let me explain something to you because I lived a compromised life when I first got saved. I loved Jesus, but I did not understand how to get free of all the sin I was in. In spite of that, miraculously, in all glory to God, because it was not me, he allowed me to lead some people to him. But here's the truth about that. If you are speaking Jesus and you are shacked up with somebody or hanging out in the clubs every weekend, then every time you try to witness, though you are acting like a Christian, your life is speaking a lot louder and it is calling you a liar. Can I just tell you that? Please hear me. Because the way you are living your life is a compromise and it contradicts everything you say you believe. Put your behavior where your words are. If you really believe in him and you really believe what the Bible says, then you should live your life by that. You either believe it or you don't. Okay? If you really believe in him, you should love him. If you love him, you will keep his commandments. The Bible says that. He says, if you love me, keep my commandments. If you fall, you get back up and you wash the mud off you. You clean it off. But if you stay in the mud, you did not just fall. You liked it down there, okay? And you wallowed in it. All right, let's face the facts here. If you don't live what you believe, you are living a lie. I'm trying to help you. We're in the end of the end times. We could get bombed any day here in America. I mean, we, we get on a lot of people's nerves around the world. Anything could happen tomorrow. Anything could happen to you tonight. You better be right because you can't change your mind once you step across the eternity line. So is the problem you don't really believe what you say? You need to give that some thought before it is too late to give it some thought. Because if you wait too late, you're not going to be able to change your mind anyway. And I don't, want to, I don't want to be looking down in hell on y'all when we all get up to heaven, okay? I don't know if we can see that. I hope not. But pretty soon it's going to be too late. That day is going to come upon you suddenly, and you're going to be left behind in the horrors of the great tribulation to be refined because you refuse to get it right now. Or you're going to be taken in your sin, which is even worse. We are going to talk a little bit more about adversity next week, I think. That's all I have for y'all this week. I hope this podcast has been a blessing to you and helped you understand adversity at least a little bit better. It will help you get to know yourself real quick. We need to understand it because none of us will live a life completely free of it. Jesus bless you. Thanks for listening. Y'all have a great week. Thank you so much for tuning in today to Just Praise Him Radio. I hope this has inspired you to a closer walk with Christ. You can contact me by mail at my new address, JPH Inc., P.O. Box 854, Altus, Oklahoma. That's A-L-T-U-S, Oklahoma 73522. Or by email at wingsofprophecy at gmail.com. JPH is not affiliated with any nonprofit organization, church, or denomination.